Were you really injured in that car accident in college? Because I believe you faked it. I believe you took the opportunity to end your football career, no questions asked. And I think you did it, of all things, for a woman. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Football's what, just 10 years? But love, mm, now that's forever. And that little bit of sadness in the mornings you spoke of, I think I know what that is. Perhaps you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Hello, listening people. Hello. You're listening to Spin Posh Presents Pictures Power. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Swinski. And I am Bartek, the other host. As you may or may not hear, we are remotely recording. This is our first venture doing so, isn't it, Bartek? Yeah, first time not looking at each other. <laughs> not looking at each other in the eyes. Yeah, we don't want to do it over video because I just don't want to look at Bartek in his filthy house. With yeah, his... I don't I don't want to find out if my webcam still works. I think it's like behind the monitor somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I get those scam emails saying like, oh, I've recorded you masturbating to filthy porn. I'm like, nah, the webcam's not looking at me. I love that you get those and I have never gotten any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Which indicates something about our web histories. But, uh, Bartek, we are remote recording because of the deadly virus plague, but that isn't stopping us from doing our podcast. For the foreseeable future, we'll be doing it like this, but uh, we long for the days in which we can look across at one another and see the disapproval on each other's faces when one of us say that we do hate a movie or we do really love a movie and the other one's not as loving of it. Mm. This week on the pod, we are doing a suggestion that came from myself, because with Pictures Power, we do movies that have come recommended, whether that recommendation is from Bartek, myself, or the listening people. This week, we are doing one that I recommended, uh, M. Night Shyamalan's 2000 hit, or not hit, but uh, 2000 film Unbreakable with Bruce Willis, Sam Jackson, and uh, Robin Wright as well. Let's not forget about her. She's in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um... Jenny from uh, Forrest Gump, isn't she? I do believe. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe. Yeah. I think she is. I think she's Jenny. Your mm. favorite character from Forrest Gump. Everyone's favorite. Ha ha ha, Jenny. Everyone, even she loves weird, him. Even Weed Al agrees. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she went to the white? No, the, no that's the next line. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we did Unbreakable. So for you listening people, make sure to watch Unbreakable because we'll be talking about this film in depth with spoilers. Uh, we may also touch upon, or I may also touch upon the film Split, and a little on Glass, even though I haven't seen Glass, I, I know a little bit about it, so if you're not as confident about listening to, like, we won't really touch on those that much, we're going to be focusing on Unbreakable, but those films will be mentioned in some way, shape, or form, yeah. so... By Ryan, not by me. <laughs> yeah, by me, so... Make sure to check out Unbreakable, definitely, because we're going to be talking about it. It's an M. Night Shyamalan movie, so of course there's twists and turns on the story that aren't as obvious if you don't know anything about it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that. Uh, it's worth the watch, definitely, even if you don't like it. It's definitely worth the watch at some point. I say that about every movie we've done on Pictures Power, <laughs> just yeah. so that they listen to our episode. Um <laughs> Ryan, that's 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 showing what's behind the curtains. You can't say that. I will say it. Who oh, said? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can say it. I can say it whatever I want. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doormat. I'll agree to anything. Hey, that's right. You're a doormat. Uh, I'll wipe my feet on you. Uh, uh, wear, wear shoes. Wear shoes. Uh, that's better. <laughs> so, the webcam wasn't watching me. Uh, so unbreakable. Two thousand. Uh, we did it. I'll talk about my history, and then Bartek will talk about your history if you have any. Uh, I've mentioned Unbreakable on the show before a few times. Last time I mentioned it was obviously last episode, but before then it was for our episode on Lady in the Water, the other so. M. Night movie we've done on the show. Mm. And I lamented that Unbreakable is so good that I still have some favor towards M. Night as a filmmaker because of its greatness. And I said, like, that movie's definitely in like my top 10 movies. Or at least it's a movie that I really do appreciate quite a bit. It's one that I have a real connection with, and I think it's his best film. I, I think it's better than The Sixth Sense, because I think it holds up on rewatches far more. Like, Sixth Sense does hold up on rewatches, but there comes a point where I feel like you can say you've watched it enough. 
while I think Unbreakable for me personally has a little bit more of a rewatchability factor, and I also just engage with the characters and the story more, but that's subjective, you know, that's just my opinion on it, and uh, yeah, I've watched this movie, you know, from when it came out to now, I've seen it I don't know how many times, it's just one of those movies that, you know, it felt like a movie only I had seen, because so few people would talk about it. And then over the years, you know, more people have seen it, more people have talked about it. Split came out, and that made people want to go back and see it who hadn't seen it, because that was a big hit at the time, Split. And so more people have kind of come to appreciate this movie than when it initially came out. And I'm very glad. I think it's a movie that uh, deserves people seeing it with their own eyes. Bartek, what about you? What's your history with this? So I hadn't seen it, but I do remember you bringing it up a lot. But it was always one of those ones that I couldn't quite remember what it was about it that you would bring up. Mm. And I know that a few weeks ago, I think it might have been at a movie night we were having, you brought it up again. And I mentioned like, oh yeah, you know, that's one of the ones that I haven't seen. And you had like a sudden reaction to that. I'm like, oh, wasn't this established? And also this reaction is pretty big. It must have been one of the the big films that Ryan brings up a lot that he mm. really likes that I haven't seen. So when you picked it for the show, I was like, okay, now we're going to see what all the fuss is about. And yeah, I watched it last night. And I, it's, I know that M. Night Shyamalan has that whole thing about, you know, every film has a twist ending and, you know, say what you will about them. But um, I think it was around the time when the twist ending happened that, like, you know, everything just came full circle. I'm like, oh, right, I can see, I, can, I get this film now, yeah. Yeah, and that's not even true with M. Night. Not all of his films have a twist ending. I was actually speaking with this about my parents earlier today. I was saying, what's the twist in Signs? It was marketed, everyone knew it was about aliens. But, like, there's no twist in Signs that I can recollect, uh, other than what the backstory is. Is that the twist? I th- yeah, I think we were even talking about that in Lady in the Water. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't really any twist ending other than, oh, that's the end. Yeah, in Lady in the Water, there's no twist ending. And Avatar, obviously no twist ending there. And well, I guess Lady in the Water would be like, oh, the twist- Mighty, you're the healer. Or yeah, there's twists, but not like necessarily twist ending that redefines the whole movie. There's yeah, twists yeah. of fate and destiny. But like, yeah, so so you didn't know about the twist? No, I didn't. So you didn't, and you didn't know about the pitch of this movie, like the 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 pitch of it being uh, Bruce Willis is secretly a superhuman. I think I might have heard little bits when I was searching for a copy of the film, but I didn't know like mm. the whole way it played out. So like, I think halfway through the film, I paused the film to do something, and I noticed like, oh, I'm I'm only halfway through the film, and like it feels like it's still just starting. So I think by that point, I realized, oh, this whole film is going to be like you know, a full-on origin story, but, like, the beginning of an origin story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, because I know a lot of people who have not seen Unbreakable, but they know the pitch is, like, guy who discovers his Superman, basically, you know, invulnerable yeah. to to illness or, or, or physical injury. Yeah, guy just doesn't realise that he's Superman, and, basically. And, you know, that, that in itself makes the mind race. And then, of course, and Sam Jackson's in it, which people may or may not know, like I said, was talking about spoilers, the twist of it is he's the arch nemesis, he's the big supervillain of the of the film, technically. He's the reason that everything has happened. And yeah. some people would do legwork, being like, oh, it's a movie about Bruce Willis learning he's a superhero, oh, and Sam Jackson's in it. And you, your mind easily goes, well, he must be the bad guy, then, because Sam Jackson has played bad guys for pretty much a good portion of his career, or at least he's played... Psycholo- psychologically unhinged characters and when you get yeah, pitched with unhinged. these guys are facing off against one another you go oh of course he's a bad guy but in the context of actually watching the movie there's obvious signs that he's obviously a bad the bad guy but it's more about uh, at least for myself I don't know how you feel about it like, it's about your emotional connection to Elijah Price and David Dunn's as individual characters and their relationship and dynamic to one another that makes yeah, with, the final reveal more powerful. Yeah, with me, I wasn't actually thinking of, you know, because this is a deconstruction, so obviously it uses the, the tropes, conventions, codes of superhero films. I wasn't thinking of it on the angle of, well, this is a superhero film, so it has to have, you know, an arch nemesis, a villain. So when, when the reveal ha- came about that, you know, he's the arch nemesis, the villain... That's what I mean by it came full circle. It's like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't see this coming, 
but there were all these reasons why this works, because this is a superhero story, and he's already mentioned that he's looking for his opposite. And I do know that, yeah, arch nemeses tend to be the opposite end of the spectrum, so, yeah. And that was that and, really... and that was said throughout the movie, like, we're yeah. on opposite ends, and, you know, also, visually speaking, Sam Jackson looks like a villain. He has this crazy hair, he's, he's wearing, like, a supervillain jacket, he's wearing purple, the typical colour of villains is purple... You know, that kind of thing. And, <laughs> and and the obvious of, oh, white guy, black guy, you tend to have them be opposites. I mean, yes, that's also a true statement as well that is there as well. But, uh, and, you know, obvious stuff like that. He has a cane. Bad guys usually mm. have canes. and and He falls downstairs. Bruce Willis doesn't. <laughs> he does get thrown off a, a porch into a pool. Um <laughs> Ah, uh, that's true. That's true. And then also to your to your point, Bartek, in the movie, you're not thinking about it in that way. But there must come a point, and they, that point is when Bruce Willis decides full full force that he's going to be be the superhero. He's going to be the vigilante hero. And you think that the villain of the movie is just that arbitrary, uh, the orange guy, as they like to call him, the 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 janitor who's got this family locked up in their house and has murdered yeah, the parents just, and stuff. Just the first you know, uh, Nemesis, kind of like, you know, the guy that killed Uncle Ben or whatever. Take yeah. him out, then get to the big boys. Yeah, but you don't think in this movie that there is going to be a big boy. You think that there isn't going to be a Green Goblin. You think that it is just going to be that guy, and then that's the end of the movie, and, you know, stuff like that. But then you get that furthering of, like, Sam Jackson still in the picture. You think, oh, well, is Sam Jackson the, the, the Professor X, I guess, you know, the mentoring figure? to the hero yeah. but uh no like mentioned oftentimes the villains create the heroes and their friends and that is true in in this movie um what did you think of the film overall now like you said it came together at the end for you but just as an overall film did you did you enjoy it did you enjoy the characters the filmmaking the plot you know all that kind of stuff would you watch it yeah, again I yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the big things about it was because I was still, you know, making up my mind by the end and it all came together. I'm like, oh, wow, if I rewatch this, I think, you know, I'll enjoy it way more, which um, which isn't to say that I didn't enjoy the film. I thought, like, visually it was really good. Um, there were a couple of iffy things in it, but, um, yeah, I, I, I was basically still deciding what I was thinking about the film the whole way through. And, yeah, so definitely a, one that I want to rewatch. So she said some of those iffy things. Let's talk about negatives because my list, unlike last episode, my list of negatives is so short that mm. I basically have like a two sentence synopsis of my negatives. Not even that. But I would be curious to hear as a first time viewer, and this is now 20 years later, this movie for you. Like I saw it when it first came out and there was no other movies like this. And you could still argue that there's not many like this, but we've seen a lot more superhero deconstructionist movies uh, mm. in our time. But what are the iffy things for you? The main thing, and it's one that I could probably really easily forgive, was some of the scenes with Bruce Willis's son, I feel, were a bit iffy. Mainly when he pulls out the gun on Bruce Willis. Really? What about it was iffy? I actually found myself laughing in that scene. I think you are supposed to, though. I think there's a mixture of tension and humour in there. Like, I think it is supposed to be a little bit funny. Is it meant to be a bit funny? Yeah, I think with the lines of, we don't shoot friends, isn't that right? And then the mum's like, yeah, we don't shoot friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Bruce Willis was, like, jumping between a bunch of different, you know, tactics for calming down his son who's holding a gun at him. I think that scene, for me, is one of my favourite scenes, so that's why I'm a bit like, okay, but I, I agree on a first viewing, perhaps, but I think it rides a line of dipping in and out between serious tension and levity, you could make that the, the dramatic point of the movie, but I think in the fact that in the movie it's treated deadly serious, even with the comedy aspects, because it's not just like that scene goes away. We have an aftermath of that scene when he talks to Sam Jackson about it, and Sam Jackson is very like, hey, I never said you couldn't be killed. Like, very yeah, cold yeah. and detached. He doesn't care about the fact that... Sam, Sam Jackson doesn't care that his interference has nearly you know, has caused this. And that makes sense for what we find out later about Sam Jackson. He doesn't have any ethical code. He is just about results. Yeah, for sure. But I, I just felt like, you know, the rest of the film 
didn't really i mean there might have been you know a couple of funny things here and there like you know you, you see any fucking teletubbies around here <laughs> um but yeah I, I just felt like it was a clashing of the tone that i was expecting so m- maybe on a rewatch it mm. would work better but just at the time i felt like oh i'm, I'm actually having genuine laughs here I, I don't know if that's the intention given the rest of the film that i've watched you said his scenes in general, the sun. I think there are in per- on purpose comedy moments with specifically a sun, like the the I think probably is one of the most gripping and thrilling moments, but also genuinely heartfelt and touching is the the lifting of the weights scene. That mm. scene's that scene's funny. Like every time he's lifting more weights, we cut to the sun and he's getting further and further away until eventually he's like halfway up the stairs. And I think yeah, yeah. that's funny. And, like, the kid himself is being funny in that. He's being, like, a kid. And, like, you know, hey, guys, I can't play. I'm going to lift weights with my dad. Like, I think the kids' scenes, for the most part, are supposed to have some kind of levity and humor. But then also there's dramatic stuff. Um, but what were other things that were iffy to you? Like, were there other instances with the son? Or was it just that main one? And any other things going on? Um, I think just sometimes I was... I guess I was kind of captivated by the son's performance because I wasn't quite understanding like what what he was about. Mm. Like some of like obviously he has this kind of uh, you know, emotional attachment to his dad, and uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, Um, like, I'm not too sure. Like, are you trying to say, like, uh, just the character, how they try and flip different ways of keeping the dad around? Because he does do several things to try and keep the dad, keep Bruce Willis in, you know, in Philadelphia, because... I I think, I think maybe what it is, is his performance was a bit too consistent throughout the film. Like, I feel like maybe in earlier scenes he should have like toned it down because he's like very emotional throughout the film and he's got just this tone in his voice of mm. desperation maybe just you know shifting around the levels of those tones i feel like it was too consistently like you know breaking point like why one, one more straw will break the camel's back i get that i get that so maybe a bit more of a leveling of of grief and and you know disheartenment from the kid i think it's a part of the problem of like i guess is this is taking place in the midst of their family breaking down it's already like they're already breaking down he's already getting a job off like he's already coming back from new york it isn't at that mm. point where we're seeing the relationship start to break it's already breaking and then as we venture into the movie we find out that the relationship was somewhat doomed to fail because of bruce willis and her clashing heads and about the football stuff at the very beginning and bruce willis deciding to kind of form their relationship on a lie whether it was a noble one or not it's still a lie yeah for sure like as you can probably tell from the fact that it took me forever to work out my point it, there are there are things in it that I can forgive, certainly, and I, especially when you look at the wider picture. And yeah, and you might change your mind on it for pro or negative on the rewatch. Um, mm-hmm. I thought the kid was great. I thought his performance was pretty good. I uh, I didn't find him distracting. I didn't find them trying to make him all cutesy, even though he is a cute kid. He has these big blue eyes, but. I thought he was pretty consistent. Uh, fun fact about, I don't know if you looked it up, but a fun fact about the gun scene that's based on a real incident of uh, George Reeves' Superman, uh, uh, the, the one that played it in the like on TV. Uh, a kid came to a convention with a gun and wanted to shoot him because he wanted to see if he could, you know, deflect bullets like Superman yeah. can. And he defused the kid in a very similar kind of fashion. He was like, hey, you can't shoot me. It will bounce off and hurt someone else. And you wouldn't want to do that, would you? Mm. And so that's kind of based on a real incident. And I find that very interesting that they got something like that and kind of put it into this grounded drama. Well, you know, it has its moments of levity, like you said. But overall, it's a, it's a pretty serious drama. Any other negatives that you can think of? Really, those were about it. Like I said, with the film coming together at the end, I could definitely see, like, oh, everything had a purpose to it. For me, there's only one proper negative and then one meta negative, uh, and the proper one is still a meta negative. We have pointless text at the beginning and end of the movie that feel like studio notes. We have, like, text at the beginning that's like, comic books are bored, blah, blah, blah. 
and then text at the end being like, and Elijah got put in an insane asylum for the, like, he got put in an asylum for the criminally insane, and that just feels like studio, being like, hey, it's a bit unclear what's going to happen. I think it would have yeah, been... it's weird f- that it's in a fictional story. I think it would have been fine. I think it would have been fine if you just ended it with Sam Jackson with a deranged, broken smile on his face saying, they used to call me Mr. Glass, and then you end the film. Like, they do, but they had to have this text there to explain it because I feel like studio notes were like, oh, an audience were confused about this thing. Very similar to a recent movie, Us, by Jordan Peele. That movie had pointless text in it that kind of gave away stuff. Like, you know, if you go into Unbreakable like you, Bartek, not knowing anything about it, you open up with this text about superheroes and comic books, you're expecting that that's going to be relevant to the movie and I think that's a disservice because the movie itself is a slow unfolding realisation um, yeah unless the twist is that like uh, Mr. Glass was the director of the film then it'd be like oh the hint was there from the beginning but no there isn't anything like that really no and I think the having it being about like at the very start like comic books blah 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 you are sublimely being told that this movie is going to be related to comic books and specifically superheroes in some way and I feel like that kind of minorly, very minorly detracts from the slow unfolding nature of the film because it is a slow revelation that, hey, this guy is a superhero because they take it seriously. They take it seriously. Like, how could someone not notice that they've never been sick before? They explore that. They explore, like, how can... Does he have, like, oh, well, he had a car crash so and he got injured, so that mustn't he mustn't be a superhero then because he has been injured. And then you realise that's a lie. And then you think, oh, he, he he drowned and he had pneumonia. Well, oh, you have a weakness, water then, you know, and that's kind of cool. That's my, that's my negative, one negative. And then the meta negative is it was very disheartening to me watching this film. A bit of sweet, I should say, because I kept being reminded, I kept saying out loud, like, this is the same guy that did Lady in the Water, that did Avatar, that did the happening there were so many times in the movie where i just was so disheartened because this movie is perfectly shot it's perfectly edited in my opinion there's no bizarre edits there's no bizarre camera moves there's no lacking understanding of what the characters are going through emotionally as well as plot driven wise and that is the definition of what we talked about was the errors of lady in the water and the errors of (laughs) all of his stuff in his career pretty much since the village and it, it really was disheartening to me and because I love this movie and I just see that this is a brilliant filmmaker. And I just kept saying, where, where did this guy go? Where did he go? And it just was a... That, 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 that's not negative on the film. That's just like a big meta thing of just me as an individual knowing what happened to this filmmaker. Just saying... Well, wherever, wherever he went, it was within 40 minutes of his home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And I just kept saying to myself... We'll never get a film like this out of him again. And I don't think we have. I don't think we've ever gotten a film like this out of M. Night ever again. Did he make Split and Glass? Yeah, yeah, but those films uh, I don't think are good. Oh, uh, I can't say speak for Glass, but I don't think Split's as good as this. Mm. Um, just to talk about Split and Glass, they are connected in the same universe. Split is you know, a movie where a guy has multiple personalities and one of them is like super strength. And uh, the twist is it's in the same universe as Unbreakable. The twist is, like, uh, at the end, you see David Dunn watching the news story about what's happened in the movie, and it's David Dunn. And it's like, oh, my God, that explains why the main villain guy, James McAvoy, has superpowers or this super strength. Oh, it's set in the same universe as, as Unbreakable. And then Glass is all three characters, Sam Jackson, Bruce Willis, and, and, and James McAvoy, uh, in in, a, in an insane asylum, being questioned if they're actually if this is actually real or if they're insane, and I feel the problem of that is Unbreakable made it very clear that it's real. Like yeah. the pitch <laughs> of that could be interesting if Unbreakable didn't exist. Be- Maybe they were banking on people not having seen it, but they're also banking that you you do. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, and I haven't seen Glass because for me, Unbreakable is a perfect solitary film. You could go on to see Bruce Willis be a superhero and Sam Jackson, but for me, this just stands on its own. I don't need any more. And 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like there, there is more happening with this character, but do we need to see it? I don't need to see it. And, uh, you know, and people were excited because Split made it connected. And I just thought, uh, if anything, that weakens it for me. Because for me, I think Unbreakable is perfect and it shouldn't be touched and you should leave it as it as its own thing. And Split is like, no, 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 we're connected to that thing. So it's like a tarnishing of it in retrospect. But honestly, the film is still perfect. It still holds up on its own, even with those connections. But uh, for me, I think Split kind of hinges itself on that attachment to a previous property. Even for people who haven't seen it, they're familiar with Bruce Willis as a superhero in a movie. But like... That's it. Uh, but I was disheartened to see at points of how great, great the cinematography was, Bartek. I remember you specifically talking about in Lady in the Water that you had a hard time with the visual language of, of cinematography and editing in Lady in the Water and, and, and other M. Night movies. Mm-hmm. How did you feel about it in this movie? Yeah, I remember one of the first things that really caught me was, I think the very first thing we see is all like one really long shot, and then when we get to the train, there's that interaction between Bruce Willis and the woman who sits next to him, and it was just, it was interesting, because there was from the perspective of the two seats in front of them, and like, you know, through the gap of the chairs, you look at one, then it pans over, you see the other, and at first I was like, oh, this is a bit silly, but but then I thought, like, yeah, this is actually really working for me. I I agree, and the first sh- shot proper in the movie is Sam Jackson being born, and it's through the reflection of a giant mirror. And that's... Oh, it was a reflection, wasn't it? This yeah. movie, obviously, has lots of uses of reflections, glass, because he's Mr. Glass, and, you know, imagery using reflective surfaces and glass. And that's how we introduce the Sam Jackson, is it's like this reflection and uh, yeah, of, of the glass, of the glass, and it's amazing. And in that shot, a lot of one take shots, like the scene of Sam Jackson and Bruce Willis talking at the stadium, and they're like in between the bleachers. It's like one mm. shot, and and it reminds you that this guy is an actor's director. Like he's not just a great visual director, but he lets actors act. Because uh, I've said this to you, I've said this on the pod. I think this is Bruce Willis's best performance in terms of dr- uh, dramatically. It's his best performance. I think entertainment-wise, you know, Bruce, you know, uh, Bruce Willis is great. Uh, you know, in Die Hard, I think that's probably his best for entertainment. But for serious dramatic purposes, I think this is his best. He says little, but he says so much at the same time. Like he doesn't say much with his words, but as an actor, physically, you can just read it all on him. It's amazing. Yeah, m- most of the time when I think of Bruce Willis, I just can't help but think back to, you know, all the Kevin Smith interviews where he's talking about not meeting your hero and how much he has seemingly disdain for his fans. So seeing him in this film, oh, and also like, you know, there's that Ralph the Movie Maker review of that film he was in not too long ago, mm. where he's just not giving a shit. So seeing him in this film actually, you know, giving a shit, that was really, really refreshing for my my opinion of him. Yeah, and he adds a sincerity to what is a very uh, silent character. This character could be one that's hard to relate to because of how, you know, internal he is. But Bruce Willis really delivers on that. And I think this is his best performance by far. Far and away, it's Mm. his best. And it's different for Bruce as well, because we're used to Bruce being more, you know... Die Hard. We're used to him being cocky and confident, and you know, like very aware of how cool he is and, and snarky. snarky. Yeah. And he's very good at that and being like, "I'm a blue collar guy, but I'm an exceptional guy at the same time." In this, he is a blue collar guy and he is exceptional, but he doesn't think of himself that way. He just yeah. doesn't want <laughs> to deal. The film with is it. him realizing it, and 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 he's doing the typical refusal of the call as long as he could. He is at all times trying to refuse this call of the hero. He just wants to live his life. He just wants to sort out his marriage if he can, and if he can't, he'll just go to New York and live quietly and be a security guy. He's not even confident that he will get the job, and then he does, and he's still like nonchalant about it. Like he's just like internal, internal, internal. And then Sam Jackson. Hey, we got Sam. How did you feel about Sam Jackson and his haircut? <laughs> Yeah, he was he was really good in this film. I really enjoyed him. His, I mean, obviously we meet the character when he's being born and when he's a child. But when when we actually see Sam Jackson playing him, you you really get the character. You see immediately the progression from that little boy who didn't want to leave his room and he got a comic book to oh, comic books became his whole life. Did you feel for him? 
Yeah, of course. And did you find it distracting at all that, you know, that it's Sam Jackson? You know, because Sam Jackson is a great actor, but he is Sam Jackson in everything, you know? Like, he has He's his... He's got a reputation, for sure, yeah. And outside of... And, you know, I would say that most people agree that Sam Jackson will do anything for money. And every now and then he'll do artistic merited films like a Spike Lee movie or like a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's like, he's an actor who's always great, but he is specifically great depending what director he's working with. Did you find it at all distracting that it's Sam Jackson? No, not really. Nor do I. Like, he has the Sam Jackson moments, like the moment you mentioned with the uh, him flipping out about the guy wanting to buy the comic book for his four-year-old. That's very Sam yeah, Jackson. The artistic piece, yeah. That's very Sam Jackson. You know, he was just one step away from saying motherfucker. And I love that monologue of his where it's like, you know, it's like, do you see a, a, a small Asian child with a blank expression on their face on a little machine outside? No, because you're not in a toy store. Like... He has his Sam Jacksonisms, but to me, this is also in my top five Sam Jackson performances, if not my number one. I think Quinn Tarantino gets a lot out of him. I think, you know, Pulp Fiction is probably his best performance for me, but mm. this is equal. I guess if not very, if not equal, very close. I, I have a lot of admiration for Sam Jackson in this movie. He's playing it very quiet too. And I love Elijah. I feel so sorry for this character. Like, you know how he's become a villain. You know why he's doing this. But there's this thing where, like, I genuinely am sad for him. Like, I'm genuinely bummed, you know? Like, there's that thing of each time I watch it, I know what the outcome's going to be. And you see all the 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 work put into it. All the breadcrumbs are there. But there is that thing of yeah. you feel sorry for him. Because the movie literally opens up with him suffering as a baby. Yeah, and you even get the point in halfway through the film where he falls down the stairs and you're like, oh, we've learnt enough about his brittle condition to know that this is bad news. Um, and yeah, even when you do get the twist of, oh, he was actually a villain all along, the motivation isn't, you know, just blindly for evil or for money or something like that. It was actually looking for a meaningful connection. Yeah. And even though he had to do awful things to do it, it's like, oh, it's it was more sad than, you know, despicable or anything like that. Yeah, he's looking for a meaning and a purpose to him in life because he's been bestowed this terrible, terrible, you know, illness that is cruel. And even though he's not even the worst type of this disease, he mentions yeah, he's, that. he's the best type of it. It's still a horrible thing and him being picked on and him being ostracized because of it and... So there must be some meaning to this. Uh, you know, a lot of people who suffer try and find a meaning to the suffering. And Sam Jackson has used the comic books that he was given as a gift, as a reward, as a as a present to his suffering, because that's what they were there for. They, they were a reward of him overcoming his his suffering. He's he's bestowed this meaning upon these 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 comic books, these these graphic novels to to his own suffering to a bigger extent than what his mother could foresee. And yeah, he's and doing these crimes. Yeah, and there was even that one point in the film where he was telling Bruce Willis that um, you know, because of comic books' huge prevalence and people understanding how they work, it makes people like or Bruce Willis specifically makes him less likely to believe that he has superpowers because oh that's just a comic book thing. So it's this weird kind of you know, he's tying himself to fiction, but also at that point, the fiction was working against him. Exactly. And I... Them just interacting is just great. Bruce and Sam, they have great chemistry. You can tell that they have that great chemistry of, these people have nothing in common, but they do. And, you know, they're butting heads ideology-wise. Like, Sam Jackson wants him to understand, and he doesn't want to understand. But at the same time, underneath that all, you could see a genuine bond forming. So that when Bruce Willis is practically in tears at the end, realizing what has gone on, mm. it's earned. You Yeah, he was he was definitely calling himself friend by that final scene. And it's and he just met his mum, and it's it's sad. It's it's tragic. And I've had arguments with about this movie because, for instance, my sister does not like this movie. My sister finds it boring. She finds it pretentious. She wanted more of a 
more of a, not so much a derivative work, but more of a, not so much a formulaic work, but she wanted more of a superhero aspect to this, because a lot of it is just people quietly talking in rooms. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she doesn't like it, and I, she hasn't watched it in a while, so maybe, who knows, but we've had arguments about it. She thinks it's really stupid that his weakness is water. What do you think about that? What did you think about the revelation of uh, his uh, relationship to water? I mean, it was just like, you know, uh, weaknesses are always, well, not always, but they don't have to be something super uncommon. And I think it kind of fits because, um, you know, his whole thing is strength and he has big muscles, so it adds weight to him. And, you know, what do heavy things do? They sink. So there's a bit of, you know, connection there. And I think it's and also not just on the physical terms, but in in thematic terms, I think his character is drowning in life. You know, he doesn't understand what his purpose is in the world. His relationship is falling apart. He's going to no longer be a father figure to his son because he's going to be in a different you know a different state and different city. And in mm-hmm. life, he's drowning underneath all these all these feelings. And I think thematically, it, it, it works as as well. And then you have the great visual imagery of his uh, security poncho thing being his superhero outfit, but also practically is a protection from water, which is neat. Yeah, it's like a rain jacket. Yeah, it's a big rain jacket poncho thing, and it serves as like a superhero imagery, but also practically it's an, it helps give an immunity to his weakness. When he was in that big puddle thing that that was that was a visual feast the top the the top over the pool yeah yeah like the well, I, I thought of it was like a rubbish bag but yeah it was a top and people die from that just like he did like it's not just him he, uh, not only him being weak to water but basically that's a death sentence that he was put in anyway because no matter how you try and swim out of that it's going to happen that way especially at night in the pouring rain that scene has always been emotionally effective to me. Just like you said, it's a visual feast. It's it's really engaging visually, but the idea of you getting trapped like that is terrifying, isn't it? Mm. Like imagine that. Like it's ter- the idea of drowning is terrifying in itself for a multitude of reasons, but like this idea of being wrapped up in this tarp and you're sinking and it's nighttime and it's raining and like there's no one to help you. And fortunately, there are people to help him. Which I found neat. It's a nice little connective tissue moment there. Uh, the hero getting saved by the people he saved is always nice. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big emotionally resonant movie. But some people don't like it. Some people find it a bit cold, a bit pretentious. I can see the reasonings as to why that is the way. But for me, I just don't. And I don't know if you felt any of that at all during the movie. Uh, well, like I said, it took me till the end to decide that I, I actually quite enjoyed the film. It, it was slow. I wasn't quite seeing where it was going, but yeah, it just it just all comes together, I reckon. Like, Do you remember what your first viewing was like? I was a kid, and I was one of those kids that um, didn't care for The Incredibles as a movie. Um, I still don't. I mean, I like it, but it's not one of my favourites. But I remembered I had seen Unbreakable around the same time, and I just loved Unbreakable. I've always had a bit of more of a mature sense to my film viewing experience, even at a younger age. And I remember I loved it, because I'd never seen anything like this. Bartek, you've got to think from... You've seen... You know of these deconstructionist takes on the superhero mythology, the Superman mythos. That's what Zack yeah, Snyder's well. trying to do with his Superman movies, and he can't do it because he he's, he's not competent enough. But back then, I had never seen any, or never even factored that as an idea of, you know, what if Superman, but you put a twist on it, you know, or what if Batman, or what if that kind of thing. But now we live in the age of, like, Christopher Nolan did this deconstruction of the Batman mythos, or Zack Snyder tried to do it with Superman, or you have James Gunn doing it with Super as a movie, or, or this or that. But back then, I had never seen anything like it. So as a kid, I found it engaging. Yeah, definitely in the past decade, I've heard the word deconstruction thrown around a lot, and it gets to the point that, like, oh, another deconstruction, and it does, it feels like, you know, another film, but definitely, one thing that I kept thinking about throughout this was also, 
or well, thinking about afterwards is this was before a lot of you know the big superhero movies that we remember like this was before spider-man and just around the same time as uh x-men mm. yeah that's the thing like does this movie hold up now that we are in this age of superhero fatigue that we are drowning in comic books <laughs> or does it strengthen what do you think uh, Black Panther's better, man. <laughs> but there is the thing of, even in the Marvel DC things, like their proper flagship movies, they are doing a deconstructionist take on the superhero things. Like, spoiler alert for Iron Man 3, but Iron Man 3 has a switcheroo on what the villain is. And that's like a weird kind of meta turning around the formula. And you're seeing that more and more and more with just regular superhero movies. And this is... As Quentin Tarantino said, Quentin Tarantino has an interview about this movie. He calls it like one of the greatest films of that decade, you know, of our time. Yeah, I, th I think he said it was in his top 20 films released since 1992 or something. And he said like the pitch of this movie was hard to do because this is the follow-up. This is the one he done after Sixth Sense, you know, the one that got him all the Oscars and the acclaim. And, you know, how do you mm. follow that up? And they didn't know how to, how do you market this movie, Bartek? How do you market it? And at the time, oh, yeah, they marketed it as, like, it's a supernatural, like, ooh, what's going on? Psychological thriller. But it, secretly, as Tarantino said, and this is true, you pitch it as, what if Superman was on Earth, but he didn't know he was Superman? That's the pitch. Mm. And it's great, but the problem is, if you do pitch it like that, it gives away the, 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 the film. Yeah, it's one of those things of, like, oh, I really want to recommend this thing, but I don't want to tell you much about it. I told you on our Lady in the Water episode is about Bruce Willis is on a train. He's in a train accident and he's the sole survivor. And that's all I said. That's all I said. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the beginning of the film. For sure. That's that's where you go from there. And, uh... Yeah. And, boy... Yeah. Oh, yeah, and if you think about it that way, yeah, what follows up from that is like, why did why was I not hurt? Yeah. And that is what does follow up. And yeah, it's a... It's a thing where I think it holds up more and more. And I think because of when it came out and because of the pedigree of the performances and the filmmaking, I think this film stands up really strong in heads and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's way ahead of these other deconstructionist cinematic takes on the superhero mythos. I think it stands above. I think it's above Logan. I think it's above Deadpool. I think it's above, you know, Iron Man and Iron Man 3 and Winter Soldier. All these, ooh, what happens if we twist it around? I think it's above all those. I think, you know, it is above those kind of things. And uh, some people might disagree, but I think it's it's above Dark Knight. I don't care. I, 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 I've talked about my feelings on the Dark Knight trilogy. And I think it does stand above those. And um, it definitely, It's definitely in a different ballpark, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's... It's a it's an emotionally resonant film, visually engaging. What did you think of uh, how it was visually presented? Not just the one take thing, but did you did, how did you feel about the playing around with colors being symbols for characters? Because that was in Lady in the Water, and we didn't like it that much. You know, purple, green, orange, you know all that. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was interesting. It was like drab for most of the film, but then when he was uh when he was practicing his power of when people would bump into him, all the people that bumped into him would have like, you know, more distinctive colors on them to make them easier to follow through, and I thought that was really cool. Like obviously you could see what they were doing, but I think it really looked really good. Um Yeah, just I I keep coming back to that 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 rain scene at the end where where the the top He's sinking in the top, and yeah, at the, at the time I was like, "Is this some sort of surreal thing? Is he like, is he drowning in tar or something?" But then, then you just realize, "Oh no, this is actually a real thing happening." It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just... pool cover. <laughs> yeah, and just something as simple as that could take out a superhero is also amazing because that adds to the grounded realism of this world. Like, where do you go from here is what I ask. And they went in a way that I wouldn't. But it's like, also, where do you go? Like, if you did a follow-up where he's a superhero, you wouldn't find it as, as, as true to Unbreakable if Sam Jackson became a supervillain and he built a giant laser to shoot him. Because that's not what this is. This is no, it's not. superhero in real world. And the real world thing of Bruce Willis's superhero drowns to death in a pool adds a lot more realism and weight because that would happen. If you got thrown off a balcony in the pouring rain at night and you drowned in a tarp, a pool cover, that would be, you know, yeah, yeah. 
and uh, that added of his weakness is water, then yeah, you know, but, uh, yeah, I, I like the visual language. I like, um, I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of shots are framed with characters being framed like they're in comic book panels where they're in door frames or there's lots of square or rectangular imagery around them that kind of puts them in a, uh, in a frame. Like I said to you, there's the Sam Jackson and Bruce Willis are speaking in, in between the two bleachers and they're kind of in this strip of light like it's a strip or a comic book panel oh yes that is true i remember and same with the scene you said of the train sequence uh that uh, where it's in between the seats the gaps between the chairs yeah and of course the opening with the mirror and sam jackson being born and and stuff like that there's a lot or, or sam jackson as a kid being reflected through the tv i love that shot of the mum convincing him to go outside and you see it's all just through the reflection of the little square tv and stuff like that and yeah i guess you could also make a case that like when they were looking out into the playground at the seat like the window kind of would be a panel as well but oh yeah and you could see that image in a comic book panel especially the bright purple box in the drab color scape that's Mm. very comic booky and very graphic novelly and i think it's great um did you have any other little favorite scenes or moments that really stood out to you or you enjoyed uh, those were all the big ones, I reckon. Like that that scene where he's a child, I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, just this whole idea of like, oh, well, so what? How how's the parent gonna you know bring him up, bring him to a, a healthy level? And it was just this challenge of like you know walk through the playground to get the thing, and every time you do it, I'll give you a comic book. I, I really I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and she was a great act. She's a great actress. She did a really great job. Even when we got to see her l- later on in the movie as, you know, older and stuff, and how proud she is, and it makes it all the more tragic. Mm. I really enjoyed the scene where Sam Jackson um, has snapped mentally, and he's in the comic book store in his wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bartek, um... I I thought you may have enjoyed the joke that the comic book guy said there was like, hey, if you're looking at that, uh, that Japan, those Japanese comics and jacking off back there, so help me God. (laughs) Yes, I I definitely muttered to myself, oh, they're called mangas. They're called mangas. Uh, (laughs) I enjoy that scene. I like that scene of Sam Jackson being defiant and truly mentally broken. And when you do a rewatch, it's so clear that he's the villain. Like that scene there is like, you know, typical of a villain forming and being, you know, psychotic and turning to the dark side. You've seen that in in serious comic book adaptations and silly ones. Like, they have that scene with Jim Carrey in the Batman Forever where, you know, he's breaking mentally and he decides I'm going to be a villain or whatever. Very similar kind of thing, but this is presented seriously. And then it's like, oh, he figures out through one of the comic books on the ground that, uh, that the water is a weakness. It's his kryptonite. And uh, stuff like that. Uh, I I think this movie's flawless. I don't have a single issue with it. The music's great. Visually, it's great. The performances all hold up. And I think as a deconstructionist take on the superhero mythos, it just stands up stronger with each passing year that we get superhero movies. Like, uh, it's amazing. And then Sam Jackson is now, you know, Nick Fury. And it adds a little bit of a weight to that as well. Because, you know, this guy... You know, he's the big head guy in the Marvel Universe. He's on charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. and whatnot. But I remembered him as Elijah Price with his big haircut. Yeah, <laughs> I was reading trivia, and apparently there's a there's a notable frame somewhere in this film where he's, like, standing right next to a Nick Fury comic. He is, like he that. is. I, I, it was in the final scene where he's at the gallery showing off his painting, his artworks <laughs> and stuff, and it's... Uh... Oh, there you go. The scene where he's confirmed to be the villain is also the scene where he's next to, you know, his future. Mm, mm. I just think also the central idea of what if you were superhuman and didn't even know it is such an interesting idea. And the way it's explored is genuinely great. Like, I, I love the idea that he's never noticed that he's been sick or never noticed that he hasn't broken a bone before, or these kind of things, because these are little things. But when you start to put them under like a magnifying glass, a microscope, they seem so obvious. Yeah, it's it's, and I I that really hit me with too, because there are times where like even you and I are talking about something, and you ask me a question about something that I'm very familiar about that like throws me off. Like I've never thought about that before. Typically, it happens with like you know Polish culture things or my family or habits or anything like that, but. Yeah, when that happened, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is 
this is one of those just funny things that you never really think about, but then once you do, it changes everything. Exactly, and it is just a subtle, well-made movie. Um, just to talk about M. Night, he made a cameo in the movie. How did you feel? I was like, oh, it's the best part of Lady in the Water. He's in it. He was all right. He didn't do anything. I like that he played... A... It was really just a cameo. Yeah, yeah, no, he was a cameo, but I like how he played uh, a shifty guy. Yeah, I think online it just literally just said, like, oh, he played a drug dealer. Yep, that's it. Apparently he's in, his character is in Glass as well, because of course... He has to cameo in all of his movies, and if he's in Glass, wouldn't he be the same character? Apparently he is, so good for him, but... uh, Apparently there's a trivia point, or oh, apparently because mm-hmm. I read it, um, where he confirmed some sort of fan theory that at the stadium you see this one mother and child, and apparently those two characters are like major parts of Glass or something like that. No, of Split, so that's the main guy in Split. Oh, Split. Uh, abusive child. Oh, okay. Who cares? That's what I say. Like, oh, cool, cool. People uh, people do care who like Split. I don't mean to be harsh on Split. I do think Split's a good, fun movie, but like I said, its connections to Unbreakable uh, are, are nebulous to me. I just don't get thrilled by it. I remember saying mm-hmm. this to someone, and they were like, they love Split more than Unbreakable, and they're like, you're, you're nuts. And I'm like, maybe I am, but for me, I just think Split and Unbreakable, they're both entertaining movies, but they're both very different movies. And to mash them together is is kind of a bit disingenuous to both films, I personally think. And Glass, I just have no interest in. Maybe if someone suggests it for the pod, we'll watch it. But Rachel Rachel asked me, my wife asked me last night, are you sure you're never going to watch Glass? And I'm like, only if someone f- puts it on in front of me. I just don't have any interest. And apparently it's not very good. Uh, and I'm not shocked because, you know, M. Night came up with a lot of his great ideas in a short time frame. Like, Split came up as an idea around the same time he came up with Unbreakable. And okay. he's one of those guys where he had a, a short period where... It's like the Pixar Yeah, thing. he had a short period of time where he came up with all these great ideas, and then he made them, and now he's out of them. Maybe one day I'll see Glass, but it's not on my top priority list. And uh, I think just this movie stands on its own. I think... I, I, I don't know if you found it tragic, but I did find it so tragic at the end when Sam Jackson is just recounting, hey, they... They called me Mr. Glass. It's just so sad. Yeah, it's it's what I... I mean, obviously, it's the last thing in the film, but I keep thinking about it even after I finished watching it and I was watching other things. Because he says it with, like, now there's a triumph to it. You know, now it means something. It's not just a cruel thing said to me. But, you know, it's sad because it what it means now is mm. terrible. Yeah, he's, like, sharing something that's always been on his mind, but now it's, like, people will understand it. Like, if he just said that at the beginning of the film, be like, what are you talking about? He does say it throughout the movie, like when he uh, gets his leg with the needles put into it at the hospital, and we have that shot of him laying side on his side, and he doesn't blink, and it's zooming in on his eyes, and it fades to something else once it gets right on his eyes. He just responds, the, you know, the, uh, the kids were right. It's like, what kids? The kids, they used to call me Mr. Glass, and it's like sad and pathetic. But by the end, yeah, he, but says, then, he says it yeah, with triumph. But- yeah, but he also has that preface at the end where he's like, I I knew it all along because of this, and then he repeated yeah, it. And, it's, yeah, it's sad. And uh, Bartek, this film is like, you'll get, I think you I hope that you get more out of it on the second watch, because me, like I've watched it multiple I times, genuinely, and there's just so many things yeah, that are like riding 101 that are like, oh, this got set up, this got set up, and it's amazingly well done. Yeah. I genuinely think that I'll enjoy it more on my second viewing because, like I said, it all came together in the end. And if I can see all those, you know, facets on their own, knowing the end, that'll definitely be like a little treat about, you know, analyzing how everything was set up and executed. And yeah, I like one of the things I loved on the rewatch is Bruce Willis. One of his first lines is he mentions that he's got a fear of water when he's talking to that reporter. And yep, and he's that. like, yeah, but I, I'm afraid of water. Is that a big deal? And it's like, it's set up immediately. This is just basic stuff. But it's the fact that it's basic and M. Night doesn't adhere to basic writing tricks anymore <laughs> is what makes it so unique and rare to me. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, stuff like just simple setup is so unique now because of what M. Night is like. And not just simple, but 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 uh, not only just simple, but it, it adheres to the character, but also it isn't patronizing and it is fruitful to the end product. 
M. Night just doesn't seem to have that ability anymore, and it's just sad to see. Uh, I still think that one day he'll come back again, strike us with some really, really, really good work, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, anything else you want to talk about with Unbreakable, Bartek? Uh, putting aside Unbreakable for a second, how many films in your top 10 are directed by someone who mostly produces not great stuff, but then has one really good thing? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, not many. <laughs> just oh what if joel schumacher and m night Shyamalan work together on a it's film? just them two i think yeah <laughs> far out yeah well they should like double negative yeah like a really good like film. if they work together they'll make the best film ever made yeah <laughs> yeah far out yeah i didn't even think about it like yeah 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 you're right they'll make they'll make, every film will be great except one and they'll just be like oh there's the one not good <sighs> wow they mean they need to make a cinematic universe <laughs> where they connect their movies together like lost boys meets you know uh uh the happening yeah <laughs> what defense no. defense comes up to 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 bruce willis and he's like oh my son did this once with the gun <laughs> yeah he lives yeah uh, <laughs> yeah dude anything else you want to say about unbreakable uh i think i think we've covered it all yeah, I think so too. Anything to say? Anything to say about the wife? Oh, no, she was just good. Like you know, like her character doesn't have to do too much, but she adds an emotional anchor point for Bruce Willis's character, and I genuinely root for them as a couple to work it out and get back together because it both seems like they're reserved in the breaking up process. Like it seems like both of them don't want it to happen, but it kind of has to. Mm. It's not like she's yeah, a then... shrill, vindictive bitch that has to get over herself. I think there was also a good balance between like, you know, things are going wrong, working against us, but we are trying to work through it. It's not like, you know, they're completely blind of like, if we love each other, everything will be, you know, a okay. It's mm. like, you know, let, let's let actually have a second start and like commit to it. And just to go back to that balancing act that didn't necessarily work for you sometimes between the levity of scenes and the drama of scenes. There's a scene with her that does that that I think works well. When she's at the doorway and she asks if he's been with anyone else, it doesn't matter mm. if you have. It won't affect me emotionally at all. And then when he says it and she starts to cry really, really hard about it, there's a bit of a humor there. Because it's been set up like she's very much like, even if you have, I, I won't care. It won't matter to me. And just that reaction of overwhelming emotional reaction to something she said she wouldn't have is just a bit of a levity to the drama. And, you know, I think it works for me. Sometimes it doesn't work for you. But, you know, maybe on the rewatch it will or won't. But, uh, yeah, I think it, that's... It was mainly... It was mainly with the kid, but again, yeah, I think I can forgive But it. I'm saying, like, it's a thing that's throughout the movie, but for you it was amplified with the kid. Like, you, you honed on, you honed in on those scenes with the kid, but for my viewing experience, that balancing act between levity and drama is woven throughout the scenes with all of his family members, including the wife, but just every, like, a lot of it is it's interwoven, but it's not saying this is a comedy movie, but there is some levity thrown in that is this balancing act but for you the scenes with the kid just didn't hit a hit accordingly mm. i think that's it with unbreakable dude uh the music's great just gotta amp that up the music is great uh amp, the amp, music. amp amp it up uh yeah that's unbreakable it's a it's a it's a movie that has got more and more acclaim as time has marched on and i think it is one of those movies that deserves it and in a m season of time where we are drowned in superhero media it's great to look back at something like this and see how its commentary from 20 years ago echo into the current landscape. But as Bartek said, it's no Black Panther. Uh, yeah, no Black Panther it's no at Suicide all. Suicide Squad. Didn't win an Oscar for makeup or anything, so screw it. <laughs> Did this win any awards? No. no. No, it got overlooked. This is one of those, it got overlooked. Like, if you look at all the critic responses from the time, a lot of it is... Oh, the ending twist is, is is weak and compared to Sixth Sense. And it's like, it's unfair to compare them. They're different movies. They're different, not just because they're different movies, but it's like, you know, he was, you're the twist guy. And this movie does have a twist, but it's not, a, and I've argued with my sister about this. It isn't about the twist. Well, Sixth Sense, it is about the twist on a level, but that is a main draw of it. But I don't think that this movie is fully reliant on just the twist. But maybe that's just me and my bias. Uh, Bartek, are you ready to hear what listening people's choice is for next episode? 
Oh, it's it's almost like I didn't pick it. You didn't pick it, huh? No, I didn't pick it, actually. We... I don't know why I made it sound like, <laughs> you know, we were making a joke. It wasn't a joke. Ryan picked it. I actually don't know what it is. Um, so, I so am ready. Next week, Bartek, we'll be joined by some fellow podcasters Ooh. as well. Are they foreign? Are they foreign? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> returning podcasters, the Chats, a television podcast. Uh, Alan and Magellan will be joining us, hopefully, if everything lines up. If the world doesn't fall into the happening, Ooh. where we all start killing they, ourselves they... <laughs> because of a deadly pathogen in the air. So they missed out on another one of your top tens, huh? Ah, uh, yes, yes. I made sure that they picked a movie this time because... Uh, Ooh, good. <laughs> and we're watching a movie that has hovered in uh, in my existence, but I have not seen it. It hovered in the existence uh-huh. of being one that we were going to do for unappreciated masterpieces, but it just never got on the list. It's a Disney movie. A uh, live-action one called... Uh, this is one of those ones where I haven't had to say it out loud, so I don't know if it's this, but uh, uh, Max Keeble's Big Move. Okay. And that's the movie that they wanted to do. That's the movie we'll be doing next next episode, so make sure to check out Max Keeble. Keeble being K-E-E-B-L-E. Uh, all I know mm-hmm. is Larry Miller's in it. That's all I know. He's he's all right. Is, he's is the it, principal. Is it friendly? <laughs> is it friendly in the Trump era? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So, Bartek and I haven't seen it. So, listening people, make sure to check that out before next week. We'll be discussing that hopefully with our guest, the Chats the Television Podcast. Uh, like I said, they're a television based podcast. So, we'll see how it goes on their movie skills. Now they're good. We've had them on before for, for falling down episode. Uh, uh, so Bartek, thank you very much for doing this with me remotely. This was an yes, yeah, spit and polish and Skype, spit and polish and Skype it up, bitch. Yeah, Skype and polish, Skype and polish. Uh, which I don't think has a Polish word. I imagine there's no Polish interpretation of what Skype is called as a business. Well, they just call it Skype. Uh, so that's it, listening people. You can find us on the social medias of Facebook and Twitter. Just look up Spit and Polish Presents. In fact, if you look up Spit and Polish Presents, you'll find us on all the podcatchers available as well, which you can, of course, rate and review us on. Don't be like the critics of Unbreakable at the time and just be like, they started out strong and they got weak at the end. Acknowledge our greatness. Acknowledge it with a five-star review. How dare you? Like, you know, the Spin Polish Presents is pretty decent, but it's just no sixth sense. It's no sixth sense, yeah. It's no uh, unappreciated masterpieces, this picture's power well. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we have an email, spitandpolished at gmail.com. That is also in our description. All of this is in our description of the episode. You can feel free to email us with your thoughts, your views on the movies we have discussed, suggestions for movies to do down the line, because, of course... As I said, next week's episode is a listening people's suggestion one. We have a list of listening people's suggestions and we're working our way through them every third episode. And if you put one on there, we'll get around to doing it. Uh, Bartek, anything else I need to mention or say? Um, no, I'd say, I'd say that's, that's the usual. That's the usual. Uh, yep, of course, in this time of serious uh, biological hazard, wash hands and all that jazz, uh, you, you people should know what to do. I think our listening people are pretty intelligent. Uh, Bartek, a They're pleasure. pretty wash hands agent. They're pretty wash hands. Bartek, a pleasure, as always, and um, until next time, listening people, remember to be kind to each other. Don't call people Mr. Glass or they'll become a supervillain, okay? Don't do that. And if you get any if you get any scam emails, you know, talking about how your webcam has caught you doing naughty things, pay attention to whether whether you actually have a webcam or not.